Ready to start? Sure. Yeah. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to Concord Bookshop. Uh, we're very happy to have today Ben Z. Rose. Uh, Ben's an avid student of early American history. Uh, he's a security analyst by profession. He was educated at George Washington and the University of Michigan. Uh, leaving no stone unturned in a quest for unique insights into, into Stark's life and times, Rose conducted on-site research at the Un uh, New Hampshire Historical Society and State Archives, Vermont Historical Society, Massachusetts Historical Society, and Bennington Museum Library. His tours of numerous battlefields include Bunker Hill, Bennington, and uh, this helped him to visualize the setting for Stark's greatest achievements. Uh, Rose lives near Boston where he's surrounded by the reminders of 18th century America. John Stark, Maverick General is his first book. Uh, I've started reading this book myself. I've read the first 75 pages or so and it's fascinating. It's filled with all kinds of interesting facts. I could recommend it wholeheartedly <coughs> to anybody. Uh, um, we'll be selling this. Uh, 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 ben will be available for signing. Uh, and we'd greatly appreciate <coughs> whatever you could do to help us out as an independent bookshop. We really need the business. And it's also, like I said, a very fine book. Uh, with no uh, further ado, here's Ben. Thank you very much, and thank you for that introduction, Mike. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here um, at the Concord Bookshop, and uh, I live just a few miles from here, and I want to thank uh, Jill and Mike and uh, John Netzer for having me here. Um, all of the events following the initial um, release of the book uh, have been very gratifying, but you know, coming here to the Concord Bookshop, where I know um, they're very selective about the authors and the books that they carry is, has, has really been, in fact, one of the most gratifying things um, so far throughout this whole uh, experience. And um, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, what piqued my interest in John Stark, why I chose to write a book about him, what I learned in the course of my research that um, I think helps to explain some of his motivation as what I would argue is one of the key founders of um, the American Republic talk a little bit about his contribution at Bennington um, and of course the origins of the phrase live free or die uh, which has become the state motto of New Hampshire and words which are a fact are in fact attributed to John Stark so I'll probably do a little reading from the book along the way um, like many of you here I've been very interested in the character of the founding fathers um, I suspect many uh, some of you have read the books by uh, David McAuliffe on John Adams and Joseph Ellis's wonderful book on George Washington. And I too have been uh, interested in um, the period. The military aspect of the uh, revolution has always been of strong interest to me, but not necessarily in the conventional way of um, understanding the various different battles and campaigns, although that's an interest of mine as well. But I felt during the course of my own research and my reading of the period that there really hasn't been a lot of emphasis placed on the key military figures. Outside of Washington, we all obviously know George Washington as the leader of the Patriot Army, as the first president of the United States. We're also familiar with Benedict Arnold, uh, who was um, sort of an anti-hero of, of the period. But the success of the American Army against the British came down to much more than, than a single commander in the form of George Washington. And in fact, John Stark, I think, is one of those that emerges as really a key figure in the period. Um, in the first 30 months of the war, consider that the Battle of Bennington, where John Stark was instrumental in demonstrating to the British that this was not going to be a mere rebellion, but an actual war. Um, at the Battle of Trenton, where Stark was in the forefront of the early morning attack on the uh, Hessian mercenaries of the British Army um, at, that, uh, at the conclusion of the campaign of 1776. And then at the Battle of Bennington, where Stark led mostly an all-volunteer militia that was um, successful not only in taking out one of every six soldiers of the British uh, General John Burgoyne, 
but capturing really critical intelligence that was used later in the Battle of Saratoga, and ultimately, I think, was responsible for the American uh, victory in the war. What do we know about John Stark other than his showing up um, almost uh, miraculously at some of these early battles to play a key point in each of those um, victories? Well, we know he was born to Scotch-Irish immigrants to the United States in 1728 in, the, in what was the colony of New Hampshire. And what we know about his parents is that they had a very tough period first in Scotland um, being subjected to the Test Act, uh, not being of the state religion, being, being of uh, the Presbyterian Church, and having a tougher time when they moved to Northern Ireland experiencing financial hardship uh, when they arrived. So John Stark was brought up, I think, with this suspicion of king and state church, and uh, that was an experience that he harbored in his uh, youth. At the age of 25, he was part of the um, Rogers Rangers, which was a legendary British militia group that served alongside the British and fought against the French and Indians in the French and Indian War. It was during this period that Stark experienced what I'll call a second-class citizenship as part of the British Army. So in other words, the Rangers were skirmishers. They fought um, often on snowshoes in the dead of winter when the regular armies went into hibernation um, and fought very effectively for the British, but they were never integrated into the army. Robert Rogers himself was considered um, a provincial and not a regular. There was an incident that the Rangers experienced during that war out on the banks of Lake Champlain where a group of the Rangers were caught dip dipping into the uh, British soldiers' rum supply. And this was uh, very much something that was frowned upon by the British uh, military leaders. This was, of course, the most disciplined army in the world. And for their transgression, the, uh, a, a group of these rangers, who were John Stark's friends, were brought to the whipping post. And they were tied to the whipping post and received a um, hundred lashes each. It was a horrible uh, treatment uh, for a transgression that, uh, wasn't committed against the enemy, but was, um, you know, a, a violation of the Army's practices. Many of the Rangers resigned at that time, uh, in protest to, uh, the harsh treatment of the British Army. John Stark stayed on, but I think he carried that experience well after the French and Indian War, um, and he remembered what it was like to, um, be part of a group that was fighting, uh, basically for the British cause, but, was not really able to benefit from it um, and a group that I think was always looked down upon. I think a third motivating factor that I found in my research was that uh, Stark very much had a, had a desire to be a commander. He was a good soldier. He was an instinctive soldier. He uh, enjoyed um, leading men uh, in this particular avocation. And um, I think that was a powerful motivating factor that um, led to his wanting to, at the age of 46, um, volunteer and be amongst the first to volunteer when the shots rang out here um, at Concord and Lexington. If you can put yourself back in time, since we are in Concord um, and we're coming up to uh, the celebration of Independence Day. Um, in April of 1775, uh, the shots rang out here and it was very much a clarion call to those that lived in the area. John Stark, living in New Hampshire, was amongst the first to leave his farm and ride 60 miles down to Medford and Cambridge where the Patriot Army was gathering after the successful skirmishes that occurred here. Uh, Stark didn't wait for the New Hampshire legislature to choose their commissions. He went ahead and uh, came down here on his own, led about 800 men through force of personality <clears throat> and force of conviction, he was able to um, gather those men who came down here with him. And uh, pretty soon, <coughs> now we're talking about May, uh, late May of 1775, Stark as a colonel uh, who had um, very shortly a joint commission from the Committee of Safety, the Massachusetts Committee of Safety, and the New Hampshire um, colony as a colonel uh, actually had um, leadership over the largest group of uh, people from Massachusetts or New Hampshire. I think it's at this point that I'd like to do a short reading from the book.
because it um, we're at the eve of the American Revolution. I see some familiar faces <laughs> in the back, um, which is nice to see. We're at the eve of the American Revolution, and Stark, as I say, is 46. He comes out of retirement from Rogers Rangers, where he was a farmer. Um, and so here we are in June of 1775. I guess I'll do a, a brief reading. On a hot summer afternoon in mid-June, John Stark received word he was needed for battle. He had spent the morning preparing 800 men to raise arms against the strongest army the world had ever seen. On this fateful day of June 17, 1775, the army of Great Britain, at the peak of its imperial glory, was trying to quell the rebellion of its most nettlesome possession. On what began as the sort of morning New Englanders longed to savor after enduring a cold, wet spring, the odds favored the British to overtake 1,500 American militiamen gathered on a hill above Boston Harbor. Military intelligence for the rebels had always been exceptionally keen in the Boston area, and it was now widely known that the British planned to overtake the hills around the city. In doing so, the British intended to break loose from a blockade which kept them confined within the city of Boston. Rather than wait for the enemy to strike, the American command decided to lure the British into battle in a place of its own choosing. As the rebels had been preparing, uh, working at a feverish pace since sundown the day before to create a fortress that was designed to force the enemy to change its plans. That same evening would be an eventful one for John Stark. A 46-year-old colonel from New Hampshire, Stark commanded one of the largest regiments yet to be assembled by the young Patriot Army. A forthright, front a forthright frontiersman who knew how to lead men amid great uncertainty he was an immensely popular commander. Over the next 30 months, he would play a pivotal role in several of the most critical battles of the War of Independence. In an era when it was uncommon for men to survive beyond the age of 60, John Stark ended up living to the age of 94, outliving all but two American generals of the Revolutionary War. In many ways, John Stark's reputation preceded him. Some 20 years earlier, as a captain fighting along the British in the French and Indian War, he employed the tactics of stealth and surprise learned at an early age from his Indian neighbors. As a member of Rogers Rangers, a special forces unit of the British Army, John Starr carried the battle to the enemy in the dead of night, often leading men battling on snowshoes during the frozen months of winter. Of all the Ranger companies formed during the French and Indian War, Rogers Rangers was the most storied and arguably the most effective. Ironically, John Stark would use the same guerrilla tactics with devastating impact against his former British allies. Well, I could read more. <laughs> Hopefully that gives you a taste of uh, some of the narrative to come. He is, in fact, as it, it, in this brief opening chapter, Stark is joined by his 15 and a half year old son, who has left his home without Stark's blessing to uh, come and uh, join his father in battle the eve before the Battle of Bunker Hill. In fact, that's how widely known uh, it was that the uh, American army was so close to battle. And um, Stark's son winds, winds up participating in that battle at the age of 15. He was an underaged uh, soldier. <clears throat> but um, again, I think a very important reminder of um, the kind of um, sacrifice that people of this generation were capable of uh, adhering to, and I think John Stark stands out in that. Lest you think that the book is simply going from battle to battle, that would have been an easier way to write the book, and there's certainly much about uh, some of the key battles that John Stark fought in. I tried to key in on three or four um, important people in John Stark's life, and these include Robert Rogers, who I mentioned was the ranger uh, who started Rogers Rangers, which was a forerunner to the American Army Rangers. Um, Robert Rogers made a decision shortly after the start of the war to fight on the side of the British. So John Stark's best, best friend, um, John Stark's best friend in a, in a, in a, in a sense, to fight, uh, decided to fight on the side of the British. E Elizabeth Page, otherwise known as Molly Stark, uh, is his wife, who he meets at a, a fairly young age. And um, I go into a little bit of the background on 
how they met and how um, they gave birth, um, started a family. She gave birth, actually. Uh, they started a family together, and John Stark, at the eve of the revolution, had eight children. They would have three more before the war was over. Seth Warner was another key figure in John Stark's life. Uh, some of you may know the Green Mountain Boys, who fought for Vermont's independence. Um, Seth Warner was number two to Ethan Allen. And they um, were part of the Green Mountain Boys who uh, fought the Yorkers, that is, the folks from New York across the border from Vermont for Vermont independence. John Stark meets Seth Warner during a very brutal and vicious phase of the American Revolution that was the retreat from Canada during which several thousand American soldiers died of smallpox. <coughs> and John Stark and Seth Warner had to coordinate the rear guard retreat um, back from Canada to the Lake Champlain region. Yeah. Another key figure in John Stark's life was Horatio Gates. Um, this is another forgotten figure of the American Revolution. He was one of the key generals who had an almost independent command that is independent of George Washington um, under the jurisdiction of the Continental Congress. He rivaled, that is, Horatio Gates rivaled George Washington for command of the army. He was, in fact, the general at Saratoga who was so successful um, against the British. The, um, in the book, it's uh, obvious to um, talk about the Battle of Bennington. I would argue that was a turning point in the war. Again, one of the reasons I subtitled the book Maverick General is that John Stark led a mostly volunteer militia at that battle, at, at that battle over 1,200 men who were mostly from New Hampshire who volunteered because they knew that John Burgoyne was coming down from Canada to ravage the countryside of New England and try to sever the New England colonies from the rest of the, um, from the, rest of the American colonies. And it was during a time when Washington was pinned down in the Philadelphia region. This is circa July of 1777. And in the Battle of Bennington, it was a surprise victory for the American army. As I say, it took out one of every six of Burgoyne's uh, men. It captured important intelligence, and um, interestingly, before the before the battle, John Stark was censored by the Continental Congress. Why? Because he was leading a group of men outside of the jurisdiction of the army. After he won the victory, he was made a um, general, a brigadier general in the Continental Army, which is another lesson that shows you nothing succeeds like success. And uh, so he, was, he became a hero. He went from um, scapegoat to hero. Let me talk a little bit about the Live Free or Die. You know, it's been a year where there have been a couple of movies uh, with the Live Free or Die name. Uh, I'm looking forward to Bruce Willis's uh, most recent uh, movie myself. But to set the context of how the phrase came about, um, there was a gathering of um, <laughs> veterans from the Battle of Bennington 30 years after the battle. John Stark at this point is about 80 years old. And these veterans want John Stark, who was the hero of the battle, to come out and address their gathering um, in commemoration of the battle. And Stark um, had to instead send his apologies for being in uh, frail health and not being able to make the journey from Manchester, New Hampshire to Bennington, Vermont. And there's a wonderful series of letters um, between the committee and John Stark um, discussing the essence of what the significance of the battle was. And out of this um, correspondence in which at one point um, John Stark says to the group or writes to the group, our astonishing success taught the enemies of liberty that undisciplined freemen are superior to veteran slaves. He was talking about the British Army and how this, another fascinating aspect of the Battle of Bennington was that these were, this was a group of militia from New Hampshire and from Western Massachusetts and from Vermont that uh, was successful in driving sort of a three-pronged attack against the uh, British mercenary army that was there. The fact that they were undisciplined soldiers and could carry out such an effective victory against professional German mercenary soldiers was all the more astounding. Of course, they did have superior knowledge of the terrain because Seth Warner was from 
from Bennington, and uh, they were able to confer, but nevertheless, that was Stark's message. Stark went to his grave believing that the real enemy uh, of the United States was still Great Britain. There were those who, leading up to the War of 1812, and where this phrase comes out, it's about 1809, and uh, British seamen are still impressing American sailors at sea. And um, the merchant class in New England was actually very soft on the British. They didn't want to do anything to disrupt the shipping activity between the New England colonies and the British government. John Stark, uh, very much an iconoclast, a, a maverick, um, in his only sort of blatant political act after being general, had a letter that he wrote to President James Madison um, with his concerns about the British. But Stark's message, again, going back to this um, series of correspondence with the Bennington people, his, his message was, live free or die, death is not the greatest of evils. So the essence of his message is that there were things that were, that were worth dying for, that are worth dying for. I think the final postscript to the message is that live free or die was adopted by the New Hampshire state legislature at the conclusion of World War II. So it wasn't done in sort of the 1800s or the early 1900s, but at the end of the Second World War, uh, interestingly, a war where the United States came to the side of Great Britain uh, to fight against the Nazis and against the Japanese at that time. And I think it's a reminder that had uh, Stark and the Patriots not been successful, there would not have been any army that could come to the side of the British uh, and their allies during World War II. So I think Stark's legacy to us, live free or die, is a reminder that um, no matter what your politi political persuasion might be, um, as we come up to this commemoration um, of Independence Day just a few days from now, um, it's certainly some food for thought. So with that, um, I'll pause. I always like to take questions and answers. I, I don't like to talk too much as the author. I don't want to overstay my